uh, now we'll hear from um, Cindy Fulkers. Uh, Cindy Fulkers uh, is the radiation and health specialist from uh, for Beyond Nuclear and has a master's degree in environmental science from John Hopkins and is a published author of articles on radiation, health, food, and children. And she'll be speaking of that, those exact uh, subjects <laughs> right now. Thanks, Cindy. Sure, Mary Beth. Thanks for inviting me. So I'm actually going to start my presentation with a quote, and it's an important quote because it lends insight into the actions we see happening on the national and international stage with regard to radioactively contaminated food. It's a quote from the ICRP. That stands for International Commission on Radiological Protection. They are the self-appointed international body that recommends how much radiation we can be exposed to. Their recommendations are used by governments all over the world to regulate nuclear industry radioactive releases. So this is the beginning of the quote. There may be situations where a sustainable agricultural economy is not possible without placing contaminated food on the market. As such foods will be subject to market forces, this will necessitate an effective communication strategy to overcome the negative reactions from consumers outside the contaminated areas, end quote. So here you have an international body from whom we should expect a modicum of independence, trying to inform governments that they will need to convince the public to eat man-made radiation in their food. What a huge conflict of interest to my mind, but it does explain in part the push internationally to not comprehensively test for radioactive contamination and to say eating some man-made radiation is okay. It is no surprise then that the ICRP is also the group that fails to fully account for radiation's impact, particularly in utero development sensitivities to radiation. So in reality, any exposure to radiation, while in beginning supersensitive life stages like embryonic and fetal can impact later life stages through adult onset diseases and aging. This is in addition to causing any childhood diseases. Therefore, radiation taken in by the pe pregnant adult female matters because what the mother eats, the fetus eats. And I'll speak on these risks more specifically a little later. Suffice it to say that FDA recently issued a recommendation that pregnant women eat more fish. This was at about the same time that the American Medical Association issued a statement supporting more testing of Pacific seafood in the wake of the ongoing Fukushima catastrophe, which Mary Beth talked about earlier on. This catastrophe, of course, is still releasing radioactive isotopes into the Pacific Ocean. Now, there is minimal testing being conducted by researchers at Woods Hole, which is a private institute, um, but these tests are for just one radionuclide, cesium, and just conducted on Pacific Ocean water. And since fish are not being tested in any robust fashion, bioaccumulation of radioisotopes in sea life is left nearly unaccounted for currently. There are other attempts at measuring as well, but they do also fall short, certainly in the amount of food that they test. A further critique of radio, radiation monitoring in food is comparing man-made to naturally occurring radiation. So I'm pretty sure that you've all probably heard the radioactive banana trope. Well, I want to settle that right now. There are two naturally occurring isotopes that are mentioned most in this context of comparison. So they are potassium-40 and polonium-210. Bananas, nuts, fish, to name a few foods, all contain minuscule traces of either or both of these elements. And yet, exposure to potassium-40 carries some risk, as does exposure to any radioactivity, man-made or natural. But this risk varies, as not all radiation is created equal. So potassium-40 has largely been discredited as a comparison isotope to radioactive cesium, first because potassium-40 exists in a balanced state in the human body. So you can never have much more or much less of it, no matter how much potassium-40 you actually ingest. It will always exist within a balanced range with some moving in and some moving out, right? So as the old moves out, the new potassium-40 moves in, and you won't ever get an increased dose from potassium-40 outside of this range. Radioactive cesium, however, can replace stable potassium since cesium is a potassium analog. 
So not only do you have the added radioactivity in your body, you also have cesium that is chemically different from potassium, even though it is a potassium analog. This is a problem chemically as well as radioactively. Polonium-210, the second one I mentioned, is often found in seafood. It's what I call naturally occurring but artificially available. What do I mean by that? Well, there are studies that point to polonium-210's increased bioavailability in the environment, and this is due to man's interference through industrial processes, overfishing, burning of fossil fuels, uh, concentration and storage of certain mined minerals, harvesting of smaller fish, which is one result of overfishing. These practices all expose humans to increasing availability of polonium-210 through inhalation and ingestion. So at a certain point, because we've made this isotope artificially available, it has ceased to be completely natural anymore. Therefore, comparison to polonium-210 is also a fallacy. So I only bring up these two isotopes because the trope of comparing naturally occurring radionuclides in food is often used to minimize the damage of man-made contamination when, in truth, all of it possesses a degree of risk. And adding man-made contamination to the naturally occurring radiation increases that risk. So what kind of risk are we talking about? Well, let's examine particularly sensitive in utero development and childhood life stages. And I need to emphasize here, everyone must go through these stages. We all have to have a childhood to reach adulthood, so no one is immune. So let's talk about some numbers. These are dose numbers of radiation. So 4 millisieverts or 400 millirem cumulative dose of radiation is enough to cause an increased risk of childhood leukemia according to recent studies on background radiation. Now, since actual natural background radiation is about 80 to 100 millirem per year, a child would reach this cumulative dose of 400 millirem, which is also 4 millisieverts, from natural radiation in about four years of life or so, and that includes nine or so months of in utero development. So we are already at a health deficit just from natural radiation exposure in our early life stages. Adding more radiation, man-made or natural, can only increase this deficit. In studies of children in Belarus, radioactive cesium inside the body started to cause heart problems at just 11 becquerels per kilogram of body weight. Becquerel is a measure of radioactive decay. At 50 becquerels of kilogram of incorporated cesium, tissue started to become permanently damaged. By comparison, the U.S. allowable limit of radioactive cesium is 1,200 becquerels per kilogram in food. Now, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, was created in 2010 before the Fukushima catastrophe began, but in the context of the ongoing Fukushima catastrophe, one question is, where is the fail-safe? of the TPP. What protects the U.S. public from the ever-changing circumstances of this catastrophe in this agreement? Well, nothing. In fact, things get worse for U.S. consumers. Currently, U.S. children can already be exposed to 12 times more cancer-causing man-made radiation in their food than children in Japan. This is because the U.S. non-binding limit of 1,200 is 12 times higher for radioactive cesium. So any food that exceeds Japan's limit, but not the U.S. limit, can be exported here. This is true currently, but as if this weren't bad enough, under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it seems that the U.S. could be sued for rejecting this contaminated food and that U.S. taxpayers would have to compensate for perceived lost revenue from the rejection of this food. And if the U.S. were to attempt to lower its limit, as we are attempting to do through the citizen petition Jem mentioned to the FDA, it seems that the U.S. can also be sued for that too. So as an aside here, I should mention that through the FDA petition process, the coalition groups of FAN, of which Beyond Nuclear is one, have asked that this cesium limit of 1,200 be lowered significantly to 5 becquerels per kilogram and that food be tested for this isotope cesium specifically. We chose cesium because it is easier to measure than other radionuclides, but it doesn't mean that other nuclides are of no concern. The fact is measuring radioactive isotopes is tricky, whether they're in food, air, or water, or soil, or anything. So the ICRP quote 
earlier that I mentioned, they say they mention market forces and an effective communication strategy to convince people to eat man-made radiation. But in conclusion, what I want to say is that the Trans-Pacific Partnership seems to remove even those slight obstacles, the pesky, pesky obstacle, obstacles of market forces, and it removes the need for effective communication strategies. It goes straight to the realm of legal and monetary force. And when I first read the ICRP quote, I could think of nothing worse than tricking people into eating radiation while also tricking them into thinking it was safe. Boy, was I wrong, because the passage of the TPP will make matters so much worse. So that's my presentation. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Suzanne Davidson. Yes, hello. Um, I, I'm very much interested in, in the contamination of the food source as it stands now, and also it, it seems to be increasing as far as uh, the things that I've read. And what we know about that now, and also um, what kind of resources to look for on the web in terms of American food supply and the contamination from Fukushima. Mary Beth, do you want me to take that? I sure do. Okay. Um, right. So I would have to, this is Cindy, I would have to know what sources you're looking at because there is a lot of information that's floating around out there. Um, and we have to put whatever measurements we do happen to get with food contamination, and believe me, they are few and far between in the United States, in the context of what contamination is already present, both from routine releases from nuclear facilities and also from above-ground bomb tests, so, and also accid other accidental releases. So those are, you know, three ways that our food are all potentially already contaminated to a level that we don't necessarily know or are not aware of. Um, so for measurement of foodstuffs in the U.S., we have very, very little data to go on, uh, certainly not enough to get sort of a time course of what kinds of foods get contaminated when. And what I mean by that is as cesium or whatever isotopes you're, uh, you're concerned about are going through the environment, as they travel through the environment, they travel through sometimes at different rates, they get recirculated, uh, they get taken up in trees, and the, the leaf litter can fall down. And, and so what you want to do with understanding radioactive contamination is you want to take it not just one time, but you want to take it over a continual time span. We don't have anything like that in the U.S. for any food source that I know of. Now, you know, there might be some secret testing going on, but don't quote me on that. It's nothing that I've seen. Um, so as far as operating in the public sphere in the U.S. for the U.S. generated food supply, we do not have enough data to even begin to answer your question, unfortunately. Um, not to my liking. Now in Japan, they have been doing more extensive food monitoring than in the U.S., but there is some question, and actually we're trying to work on getting the information, this monitoring information from Japan in a database that would be searchable, uh, and that's something that I'm working on with Nancy Faust of Simply Info, and we're trying to get that done. <laughs> so I'm in the process now of trying to deal with that, um, but in reality, there is some question as to how they are monitoring the food supply in Japan if they're looking at foods that would A, be likely to collect the most contamination, and B, if they're looking at foods in contaminated areas, areas that we know are contaminated, versus foods from other areas that they know are going to be cleaner. And again, especially with the Fukushima deposition in Japan, you've got to look at a time course over years because as you get the spring thaw, you get snow melt from the mountains, it can wash down and contaminate what was, what was not contaminated previously. So this is a very, com very, very complex issue. Um, I mentioned there's, there's monitoring going on for seafood, but not much, not nearly, nearly enough, and it's just the water. One thing to know is that apparently they just took a measurement, Woods Hole did, off the coast of, I think it was the west coast, and it was 29 times higher, this is for cesium, um, than they expected it to be at this time after the accident began. So clearly their models 
are not being predictive of what was supposed to be happening at this time where we get a contamination reading that's 29 times higher. You're talking so, about the west coast of America? Yes, I, yes, I believe so. So this... And again, it is, a, it is a small amount of radiation, right? It's a very small amount of radioactivity, but, you know, it's a water measurement. And so please understand that it is still, it is still considered small, but at the same time, it's 29 times higher than they predicted it would be at this time. So there is a real question here as to whether or not their models are going to be correct. Um, and it actually seemed to surprise the people at Woods Hole who took the measurement. So I don't know how to answer your question. There is no really good answer to your question about food monitoring. Um, it is something that we really need to push for. We really need to push for it. Um, well, I, I understand you know, that it's not being done at the moment. I understand that. But I, I can't imagine that it's not going to become a huge issue. So who do you think is going to do it? Well, what we would probably want to do, really what has to happen, in all honesty, is probably citizens have to do it at this point. I don't think that the federal government of the United States has the, either has the structure or the inclination or the, the training. They probably have, you know, some sort of training, but they don't have the inclination or the structure to plug into trying to measure this stuff. So even though they might know what they're doing with measuring food, I don't know that they're inclined to do so. So I really okay. think that it's probably going to be a citizen movement. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Cindy, could you please explain why you can't just use a Geiger counter, a citizen consumer model Geiger counter to um, measure food? Sure. So let's take the example of cesium-137 um, and strontium-90. Those are two what I call, or what a lot of people actually call, isotopes of concern that have come out of Fukushima and that would probably come out of any nuclear accident. And those two isotopes are both radioactive, but they're very different. One of them gives off a beta. Cesium-137 gives, uh, sorry, well, it gives off a beta and a gamma. So cesium-137 gives off a type of radiation called beta and a type of radiation called gamma. Gamma is much more penetrating. It's easier to measure. Therefore, what they try to do is they try to focus on the cesium isotope, and they try to measure that in the food. The strontium-90 isotope, on the other hand, gives off a fairly what they call soft energy beta, which is much, much, much harder to measure, particularly in food. So you would have to pulp the food or ash the food. And so you might be able to get a reading in your food using a Geiger counter if it's got a high enough level of cesium contamination. Cesium is going to be difficult to measure with a handheld if it's below a certain level, but the level could still be more than you would probably want to eat. Yes, so oh, I've, I've done some reading about that, and I understand the difficulty there. Okay, That's okay, why I was good. hoping thank that you. there would be some organization that would do it, you know? Yeah, no, it, thank it, you very much. Mm -hmm.